Let us pray. Holy God, we pray that you would speak your words to us this morning. May the words of my mouth and the meditations on all of our hearts be acceptable unto you. For you, O Lord, are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So as you know, as I told you this morning, my family has been doing a lot of waiting lately, something none of us are very good at. We were waiting for Amira to start going into labor. We were awaiting the baby to come. We were waiting, 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 waiting. In fact, I was waiting for Amira's labor to get harder as I wrote this sermon. She was downstairs having contractions, and I was upstairs on my computer trying to ignore her and write. It didn't go very well. I've also been walking the fine line between grief and joy for the nine months of her pregnancy. As someone who cannot give birth to a child, walking with your 19-year-old through a pregnancy has not always been easy. Some days, finding the joy in the midst has been very hard. Today, we begin the season of Advent. It's one of my favorite seasons of the church year. And Advent is about both of those things. It is about waiting, and it is about finding joy in the midst of grief. We await, as they did many years ago, for our Savior to come to us once again. We wait in the midst of a world torn apart with grief, death, war, hatred, and fear. We wait for something to happen that will change all of that. We wait for the joy to appear. And sometimes, joy is hard to find. Even in the midst of a season whose tagline is about joy, even as we sing songs of celebration, sometimes joy can be evasive. So this year, our Advent sermon series is going to be about just that. How can we find joy in our midst this season? Since there are four Gospels and four weeks of Advent, we will be walking through each of the Gospels and their story of Christ's birth to see how they present it and what each of them might teach us. And so today we begin with the Gospel of Mark. The Gospel of Mark is not a slow Gospel. Mark is, in fact, the shortest and quickest of the three Gospels. I have a a friend in West Virginia, one of my parishioners, who used to tell people that I could give a 20-minute sermon in five minutes because I talk so fast. He meant it as a compliment. I know other people don't, but he did. And I think Mark is kind of like that. He gives us the story that the other three Gospels give us in about half the time. We also know that Mark is about doing things fast because of the word he uses. He uses the word immediately 41 times in his very short gospel. Three times as much as the other three gospels combined. So it seems like an odd choice for a sermon called Finding the Joy in Slowing Down to be talking about a gospel that speeds things up. But it's really not. One of the important things to know about the Gospel of Mark is that it is believed to be the first Gospel written. In fact, Luke and Matthew use Mark as a source for their Gospel, and 90% of what happens in Mark is also in Luke and Matthew, sometimes word for word the same. So why do we begin our series with Mark, especially when we know that Mark says not one single thing about Jesus' birth? There are no shepherds, there's no angel descending to Mary, there's no manger, it just happens. Well, we start there because Mark's gospel starts out with the quintessential story of Advent. It's about waiting and preparation, and he does that by using the story of John the Baptist. Luke and Matthew don't talk about John until about the third chapters of each of their Gospels. The Gospel of John doesn't talk about John the Baptist until after his lengthy and poetic prologue. But Mark begins his Gospel and the story of Jesus by telling us first about his cousin. I think Mark, instead of starting off nice and slow and poetic and pretty like John or with a a nice cute birth story like Luke and Matthew, Mark begins with a bang. He doesn't have a preamble that starts into his message. He just starts by saying, we don't have time to fool around. You need to hear the most important part right now. We don't have time to wait. At Thanksgiving this year, we, uh, we had Thanksgiving at my sister's in Towson. And my, uh, Mira was telling some of my siblings on Thanksgiving Day, while she was trying to walk that baby right out, that she already had her Christmas tree up and decorated. My siblings were aghast because they know that the rule in our family is no Christmas until after Thanksgiving. That's how my mama raised me. We did give Amira a pass this year because, you know, she was 10 months pregnant and she was trying to have it all up before the baby came. 
But even Ivy and Eva know that we don't begin Christmas at our house at all until after we've eaten turkey on Thanksgiving Day. There's no music, no movies, no gifts, no trees, no decorations, unless it's July, because I think sometimes you just need Christmas music in July, right? It cools you down a little bit. We were passing Valley View the other day about um, two weeks ago, and folks were out buying their Christmas trees, and Eva yelled from the back seat, it's not time yet. So clearly, I've succeeded in brainwashing them too. But really, I think this is a classic example of the struggle we have with Advent and Christmas in the church. We live in a world where Christmas stuff is put in stores around Halloween. We live in a world where you have to start getting that stuff done earlier and earlier because we are busier and busier. We live in a world that invites us into the trap of not enough time, of too many deadlines and instant results, instead of in a place that invites us to live into the mystery of Advent, into the mystery of the incarnation, and to open ourselves to the world of imagination and possibility that we find in Scripture. So Mark's beginning is unique, not just in the way that he starts, but also with the content that he uses. All of the Gospels tell us about John the Baptist, but Mark presents it in a unique way. Twice in his introduction, Mark uses the word prepare in his quotation from Isaiah. He says, look, I am sending my messenger before you. He will prepare your way. A voice shouting in the darkness, in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make his paths straight. Now, while he only mentions Isaiah, he says in his gospel the quote is from Isaiah, Mark is in fact quoting another prophet too, the prophet Malachi. His quotation is a mashup. I was thinking this week, maybe it's the first mashup. For those of you who don't know what a mashup is, it's when they take two songs and put them together. They're very popular mashups, and I think Mark had the first mashup. He mashed up Isaiah 40 verse 3 and Malachi chapter 3 verse 1. So when we read the introduction, it seems a little bit like Mark is repeating himself because he's quoting both prophecies back to back and using that same word, prepare, prepare. But in reality, when we look at the words, the Greek words that he uses, we see that there are slight differences, slight nuances in the words that he chooses. So the first time prepare appears, as in he will prepare a way, We see a Greek word that can mean to construct or create, to furnish or equip. Often when it's used, it has the sense of making a building or object ready for its use. So in scripture, we see that same word or its derivatives used to describe the preparation of household goods, containers, or other kinds of everyday items. It is also used in the New Testament to describe the building of the tabernacle and Noah's Ark both items that are associated with God's deliverance and God's presence to the people. So if we read that in the context of what the Gospel of Mark says later, we can see that he is using this first prepare to say to us, make yourself ready to be the vessel through which God's love can enter into human history. We are the container that is being prepared. The second time Mark uses that word, we can see how John the Baptist calls people to be prepared. It says, he is the voice crying out in the wilderness to prepare the way for the Lord. Here, the word has the sense of get ready for a big event, like we were getting ready for a big event this week. It means to make something ready in anticipation of what will happen later. So in the New Testament, in places like 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9, or in Hebrews 11:16, or even in the Gospel of John chapter 14, this version of the word is used to describe the great heavenly future that God has prepared for those who love him and those who follow Jesus. In the Gospels, this is the word used to describe the imminence of a great wedding or a great banquet feast. You can think of those parables that Jesus uses about the banquet that's being prepared. All of those times, it's this prepare word that's being used. And even more importantly than that, it's used to describe what will happen at the second coming of Christ, a great event that is imminent that we wait and prepare for. Even more importantly... What Matthew and Mark and Luke all have in common is that they use this word to describe Jesus and his disciples as they prepare for the Passover and as they prepare for the Last Supper. 
Mark says it this way. On the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, when the Passover lamb was sacrificed, the disciples said to Jesus, where do you want us to go to prepare for you to eat the Passover feast? Now, we know that the preparations they made for that final Passover feast were also, though they didn't know it, the preparations for Jesus to institute um, the Last Supper, to institute communion that we use as a way to remember what Christ has done. So when Mark uses the words of John the Baptist to call us to prepare the way of the Lord, he is challenging us to change our hearts and lives and make ourselves ready for the big event, ready to receive Jesus and everything that goes along with a life lived in discipleship. In other words, in calling us to prepare, Mark is telling us to do two things. One, make ourselves ready as vessels or containers or homes to receive Jesus. And two, participate sacramentally in Jesus' life, death, and resurrection. He's referencing the sacrament of Holy Communion. And then right after John tells us to prepare, we see that John is baptizing, calling people in to a baptism of repentance, the second sacrament that we celebrate. So now that we know what Mark wants us to do, the question becomes, how do we do that? How do we prepare ourselves to receive Christ or to be ready for the big event? What does it look like to prepare ourselves for Christ's coming? Well, Mark answers this question too. Really, all of the gospel writers do. How do we prepare for Christ's coming? What they say is the best way is to make his paths straight. All of them use that quotation from Isaiah. But that's really clear as mud, right? It is, as I was looking at it this week, that's the definition of a metaphor wrapped in an enigma. It's just impossible to understand. What the heck does it mean to make his path straight? I've been reading that for years with no idea of what it meant. Well, we know at least that the statement is important because, as I said, all four Gospels quote this same verse from Isaiah. And when all four of them do something, we know that we should pay attention. Even more than all four Gospels using it, if we take a careful look through Scripture, we see that this imagery of a straight path to to describe a holy and righteous life is very common throughout the Bible. In Proverbs 4, verse 25 through 27, we hear these words. Focus your eyes straight ahead. Keep your gaze on what is in front of you. Watch your feet on the way and all of your paths will be secure. Don't deviate a bit to the right or left. Turn your feet away from evil. And then in Hebrews chapter 12, verses 11 through 14, we hear similar language. This is in the message translation. Strengthen your drooping hands and weak knees. Make straight paths for your feet so that if any part is lame, it will be healed rather than injured more seriously. Pursue the goal of peace along with everyone and holiness as well because no one will see the Lord without it. So what does that mean? Well, I think Mark is saying that preparing for the imminent arrival of Christ means continuing to move forward step by step, moment by moment, dying to self, rising to Christ with each step in anticipation of a God who will become real in Jesus. I was reading this week that there is a scientific study, and if it's science, we know it's true, right? That shows that it is impossible, they use the word impossible, for human beings to walk straight all on our own. Does anybody here think they can walk a straight line? Good, because you'd be wrong. I just wanted to check. There was a study done in the 1920s, and it's been repeated over and over again, where they blindfolded people and asked them to walk straight for an hour. I wouldn't even last 20 seconds. Each person took the blindfold off and thought that they had done it perfectly, but without exception, when the blindfold was removed and they showed them the path they took, it was revealed that they had walked a crooked, crooked, crooked path. What happens, they, uh, another study a couple years ago did the same thing but animated what they did, and it showed that we end up going in these strange like loop-de-loop things, repeating old patterns over and over in either direction. What the study discovered is that we need one thing to help us walk straight, a focus ahead of us. If we have that, a building, a landmark, a mountain, maybe a star, we have the ability to walk a straight path. If we look down, we begin to walk crooked. All of it requires for us to walk straight is to look up 
and we begin to veer back onto the straight path. Our scripture lives, our spiritual lives, are like that too. We cannot walk a straight path on our own. We all think we can because we think we're good people. We think we can kick our addictions on our own or be a good Christian on our own, but we can't. It is impossible. We need the focus piece ahead of us, the landmark to follow so that we can make our paths straight. And our landmark is Jesus. So how do we begin to prepare for this Advent season? How do we find joy in the midst of the busyness of the calendars, the lists, and the world's expectation for what this holiday season should look like? We do that by slowing down. We do that by keeping our focus ahead on Christ instead of around us in the world or behind us in our own lives. This Advent, friends, I invite you to join me. Join me in getting doubly prepared for Christ's arrival. Let's do the inner work together to prepare our hearts to be vessels for God, spending time in confession, in seeking forgiveness, in opening our hearts for the grace and love with which God wants to fill us. And then let's be prepared by living in anticipation of what will come. Let's gather for worship so that we have a focus and spend time living sacrificially and sacramentally so that we can keep our paths straight. Leaning into the body of Christ and keeping our eyes towards Christ so that as we take in the incarnate one, we can be the ones who share the incarnation with the world. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God.